Let me introduce to you and preach. I have talked about all the other guys and I'll say something about Jeff too. Uh, I, I said uh, to my church members today, some of my sheep, Jesus' sheep, please let me borrow it. Uh, I said, well, you know, Jeff and Chris and Dave came to our church and they preached for us. They, uh, Chris went to Belize with us. And, and we had a great time preaching in our yellow bus and all over the country, Belize, what they were saying. These guys have become part of our church family. We just love them. They're just like brothers. And they know Jeff. They've heard Jeff preach. So when I said this, they knew, they responded. I said, well, we want to, we emailed back and forth, and I said, we want to really get all you preachers the first night, the first day, all day long. And set the tone for the conference. And you know, Cornelius Van Til used to talk about a militant Calvinism. Don't be ashamed to say you're a Calvinist and Calvin in the corner. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be victorious. We should be militant. We should attack the gates of hell. We should attack Satan himself. And the reason we should do that is because we can do that through the power of our Savior. Because we preach His true gospel. But anyway, I told him, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to wait for the last service tonight and I'm going to turn the beast loose. I'm going to turn the savage loose. I'm going to... I'm the way you not to... I'll do it. It's not, and I said, I'm going to turn the warrior loose. And you know why I'm saying this? One reason I love you. And one reason that's who you are. <laughs> and the other reason is, do you know what response I got? They said, praise the Lord, Jeff Rose is going to preach. Jeff's going to preach. And you know what I'm talking about. And it's true. I told somebody today, I told Earl today, I said, you know, uh, Jeff is, is so powerful when he preaches. Dave, you, Crystal, and Sile will attest to that. And all the rest of you guys, Kevin, all you guys. Uh, and I think one reason that he is is because he loves Jesus with an intensity that I have seldom seen. Jesus is his life. Preaching the gospel is his life. And it, 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 it vibrates through every fiber of his being. And he just can't help it. He loves the Lord Jesus. And he would probably die, I'm sure, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's my prayer. As I told him, I said, well, tomorrow night we're going to have to stand back to back and defend the whole world against the devil and hell. And... Uh, so I, I'm so proud tonight that Jeff's going to come and he's going to preach to us Jesus. Brother, I love you very much. Well, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond. But I would like to say thank you for having me, uh, inviting me to come to this um, great and it's a great honor and privilege uh, to be here at this, this event, this conference. Um, I'm always um, very aware of who I am and who I am not. And I always want to make sure that the Lord is getting all the glory and all the praise for bringing me to this opportunity and to this uh, moment to be able to declare uh, the Word of God to you. I don't take it lightly. Um, it's not a light thing for me to be up here. It's, it's a very humbling and a bit uh, terrifying because God holds us accountable for the things that we say and the things that we proclaim outdoors or indoors. And you being God's people, um, 
God holds me accountable for the things that I'll proclaim to you tonight. I haven't come with some sophisticated um, teaching, but I've come to proclaim to you what I believe that the Lord God has laid upon my heart and upon the heart of our ministry. It's really been the heartbeat and uh, the rush uh, of who we are as the people of God and those who are being sent out into an apostate world and proclaim a message that hardly anybody can tolerate inside the contemporary church or outside in the world. And this is the lot that's been given to us, but we don't look at it as a bad lot. We look at it as one of the grandest purposes that a man can be called to, and that is to take the almighty gospel of Christ to the world. And it's, 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 it's humbling um, to be able to, to realize that Jesus Christ, uh, in his sovereignty and in his power and in his providence, would use such a klutz like me and such a nut like me for his glory. And it, it's amazing to be able to go out and, and, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to deal with tonight. I want to deal with the roots of what it is that, that we've been called and commanded to do. What we've been called to, to go out and proclaim. Who it is that we have been called and commanded to proclaim. What does the life look like of a herald of a person who has been sent by their king into the world to proclaim the truth. How are we to see this in our day? In a world that's gone mad. I love the local church. I love the church of Jesus Christ. But there is something severely wrong in our day. When men cannot go out into the world and proclaim the truth, the pure gospel of Jesus Christ without being ridiculed by the supposed people of God. I'll tell you what, a majority of those who heckle us and harass us are not the sinners. A majority of the respect that we get is from the sinners. It's we definitely know where you stand, and you definitely know where we stand. And for that, we respect you for that. The majority of the problems that we face today are those that profess to know Christ. The Pharisees of our day will be quickly to confront us when we're proclaiming the truth, declaring to us that we're just not doing it right. And then when you come into the church and people know there's a street preacher in the midst, you almost have to walk around shouting unclean, unclean so everybody can get out of your way. Because it's such a reproach to today's public proclamation. Now, I don't think it's a reproach. In one sense, I think it's a reproach because of what we've seen out there in the world. And quite rightly so. Who can blame them? A lot of the nonsense and a lot of the garbage out there, the dog and pony shows, the, the, um, the big giant posters, the, the God hates fags, and all that kind of stuff that's out there. When you say street preacher, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And every time I talk to a pastor and let them know that we are open-air preachers or street preachers, the first thing I have to do is qualify what I mean. I said, we're not those guys. Just so you know, we're not those guys out there harassing and abusing people. We're out there trusting in the sovereignty of God, proclaiming the beauty and glories of Jesus Christ. Declaring that we're, we're preaching the pure gospel. Turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to Psalms 96 3. I could go on all night, but I won't. <laughs> starting, in, starting at verse 1, I'll end at verse 9. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, and show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. 
For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nation are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. I'd like to direct your attention back to verse 3. Declare his glory among the heathen. His wonders among all people. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I, I pray, Father, that you would use me, Father, for your glory. I pray that you would enable me by the power of your Holy Spirit to speak those things that would be honoring and pleasing in thy sight. I thank you, Lord God, that you keep me humble. I thank you, Lord, that there would be no contention. Lord, that there would be no vanity or vain words proceed from my mouth. I pray, Lord, that you'd be worshipped and glorified. I pray, Father, that this time together in the gathering of the saints would just be another conference with a bunch of talking heads and fancy sermons. I pray, Lord, that you would speak and move mightily for your own name's sake. That you would split our hearts wide open and awaken us to the reality of a world that needs the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't just spend all of our days shining the armor of our theology and never go to war. I pray that you would put a fire in our hearts, Lord. That you would thrust us out into the harvest field for your glory to proclaim the beauties of your Son. And this I pray in the blessed and holy and righteous name of our Lord. Amen and so be it. <clears throat> Eric Little, the famous Olympic athlete and missionary who has coined the Flying Scotsman, once remarked, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And in the same way, we could say, God has made me to preach. And when I preach, <coughs> I feel his pleasure. The Bible says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, for the world by wisdom knew not God, for it pleased God. By the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The title of the message tonight is Public Proclamation, A Call to Worship call to worship. I think we've come to a, a time in the life of the church in our country where we have literally got to put away the playful spirit that we have attached to evangelism. You know, we, we have compartmentalized evangelism and we've made it something that's almost fragmented from the local church, almost fragmented from the Lord Jesus Christ. Years ago, I bought thousands of books from a good friend of mine to sell because that's one way that I support my family is through selling books. But as I was writing through all these Christian books, I noticed that there was every kind of a book on evangelism. All kinds of ways and ideas and designs and all these different sales tactics and things to say and do. And there was all kinds of ways to evangelize. 
almost speaking of evangelism as something that was almost separated from the church of Jesus Christ. And it seemed that that very moment, something inside of me just began to crack. And I thought to myself that what have we turned the public proclamation of God's word into? What exactly are we doing? What exactly is this evangelism that we're doing? And it forced me to go back to the word of God and to really search the scriptures and search church history and look at these men that God had raised up all throughout history to proclaim the glories of Jesus Christ to the world. And I noticed that they never had a 7 to 10 outreach on Saturday nights. They never had a four ways to share your faith, six ways to reach your neighbors, sharing Jesus without fear, the good test. They were in tune with the power of God. And their whole lives were consumed in the worship and the glorification of their Lord and their Savior. It wasn't just something that they compartmentalized at a little outreach that they went out to on Saturday nights or Friday nights. But it encompassed their whole being and their whole life. They saw Jesus Christ more than just a, a four-point way to witness to someone. They saw the public proclamation of the gospel as a call to worship. They seen the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ as the greatest way that we can worship the Lord. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. This psalm says Calvin, contains an exhortation to praise God. An exhortation which is directed not only to the Jews, but to all nations. We must infer from this that it has reference to the kingdom of Christ. God's name could not be called upon in any other part of the world than Judea until it had been revealed. And the heathen nations were at that time necessarily altogether incapacitated for any such exercise. Yet it is evident that the Holy Spirit stirred up the saints who were under the law to celebrate the divine praises till the period should arrive when Christ, by the spread of the gospel, should fill the whole earth with his glory. At one time in history, the message of God's grace was confined to the nation of Israel alone. But we see here in this verse that they look forward to a time when nationalistic boundaries would be shattered and the glory of God, the glorious gospel of Christ Messiah would be preached to all nations. I submit to you that the greatest way we can love God and worship Him is to declare His Son to all people and all nations. We must, we must confront the world head on with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not with pizza parties, golfing, and water slides, but the pure exaltation of the King of Kings, who alone is able to save. Without the novelties of the world and the entangling attractions and enticements, appealing to the sensualities of the sinful nature of man, but we, the heralds of God, must, without shame, declare the glory of the Lord to the heathen. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. <clears throat> See, when we turn away from proclaiming the truth, we compensate into other things and doing other things. We become busy about every, with everything else, trying to compensate our deficit for our lack of obedience to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Dr. Matthew McMahon of the Puritan Mind in his article, Preaching as Worship, says, in the act of preaching, this glorifying of Christ is the essence of his worship. Though at the same time, his gospel preaching ministers to needful people. It is here that the preacher's feet bring the good news of the gospel of peace. And while he is doing this, he acts as God's divinely appointed herald, reflecting the image of Christ as the living word in the message he brings. The preacher ought to be exceedingly gripped with the sense that he is delivering Christ to the people through his preaching. If he is enthralled with the sense of this, then he is immediately conscious of the nearness of God. And this nearness and mode that the preacher travels through is the exact definition that God himself gives those who worship. I will be sanctified by those that draw near to me. Whether that be the priest of the Old Testament or the preacher of the New Testament, worships God as he performs the duties God requires of him. And this would be true for any Christian in the outworking of their gifts. Preaching is worship. It is the vehicle that draws the minister closer to God during that hour. Preaching is a spiritual infection which ought, which ought to impregnate the hearer with the life of God in Christ. If the preacher is intimately <laughs> aware that he is doing this through the unction and temperance of the spirit of truth, he is immediately aware that God is delighted in the work being dealt with. Dr. McMahon goes on to say, we must ask and answer an elementary question before proceeding. Is the pulpit important? Does the Bible say anything about a pulpit? Charles Spurgeon, in the church he ministered at Park Street, had a wooden pulpit. But at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he had no pulpit. Does this mean that in one place he, as a minister, preaching the gospel, worshipped, and in another place he did not? Certainly not. The absence or appearance of a physical pulpit does not determine whether a preacher is worshiping or not. The pulpit was never designed as a place of wood or glass or metal, but wherever the preacher was standing. The preacher ought to be exceedingly gripped with the sense that he's delivering Christ to the people through his preaching. I'm going to talk about three points to consider in our proclamation. The first point is preaching is a declaration to declare the glory of God among the heathen. It is a declaration. It's a declaration of the being of God, his character, his justice, his power, his omnipotence, his sovereignty, his kingship, his word. The word preached to warn, to exhort, to convict, to confront, and to redeem and save with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. You see, it's in this very declaration of God proclaimed through the mouths of his herald that God himself can bring even an indictment we can proclaim and declare the glory of God. And it brings conviction. We've seen all sorts of things take place on the streets when God's word is declared. Whether we're proclaiming the gospel or proclaiming the character of God. Because God is who he is. We would proclaim his majesty to the world. God saves us. God indicts some. God warns some. God confronts some. But it's through this declaration in by which God has chosen and ordained as a means to reach and to save his people. And not only to save, 
Sometimes it's to warn. Sometimes it's to confront. Sometimes it's just to convict. Sometimes it's to heap more condemnation upon those who reject the gospel. <clears throat> Preaching is a declaration. The Bible says in Isaiah, it says, I had set watchmen upon my walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. The Bible says in the book of Acts 4, 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In Jeremiah 29, it says, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire in my bones, and I was weary of holding it in. I cannot. There's something about the reality of who Jesus Christ is to the point where we just can't hold back. We can't compromise any longer. And that's why I appreciate a conference like this. The whole ministry and mission of Jeremiah Cry Ministries is a return to biblical truth. A return to the doctrines of grace. A return to the public proclamation of the word of God. Not only, not only just to confront all of the naysayers of our day. Not only to confront all the Pelagian nonsense that goes on out there. But to come back to truly worship the Lord Jesus Christ. To truly exalt His name to such an extent that we just can't hold back. A point where we feel that if we don't, we're going to explode. What is it that motivates us to go out into the world and to proclaim a message that a majority of the world hates. What is it that burns within us and causes us to move and do things in such a manner that we become a reproach and an offspore to the world? What is it that compels us and constrains us to go out and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ in a world that hates them? Number one, he's commanded us to. But we're compelled and strained by our love for our king. It goes beyond the fear of man, what man thinks about us, or what the world thinks about us. You see, when you see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, and your public proclamation becomes worship upon some four-point message, or to some little car salesman approach to saving the lost. But it becomes more than just evangelism, but more than just an outreach. Or more than just a gospel explanation. But when it becomes worship. When you are laboring for the Lord God Almighty. When you're moved and your motive comes from a heart of worship, your preaching isn't abusive. It isn't nutty. You aren't bouncing up and down with a big sandwich board, acting like a fool. The Bible's word says that we're fools for Christ. But it moves you as it's moved men in the past. It's more than just going out and doing our thing and coming home. It's more than just three little hours on our schedule for the week. It seizes us. It takes over our entire being. We're impregnated to the point we have to give birth to this message because we're in love with our Savior. We're in love with our King. How can we not but speak? Why are we so silent today in America, in contemporary American churches? Why are we so silent? What are we afraid of? Who are we afraid we're going to offend? 
gospel at all. Amen. We're to proclaim the truth regardless, not to compromise. We're to be faithful and biblical yep. in our day. You're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, not before me on the day of judgment. Yeah, amen. You will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a saved man, yeah, but you will stand, you will give an account for your life. I would encourage you, in the name of Christ, to move with fear and go into the world, pulling them from the flames, reaching out to a world that needs the truth, not some fake, shabby form of Christianity, some shoddy, man-filled expression of the gospel, but the truth. The truth of Jesus Christ proclaiming His glory among the heathen. This is what God commands us to do. To be faithful. But we get so busy nitpicking everybody. We become John Tillers. We waste all of our time and all of our energy chasing each other down on Facebook. Playing games. Belly aching. Murmur, gossiping, envy, jealous. We waste so much time creating battles to fight. Creating these, these fake monsters to fight. Where the real fight is without our souls. <coughs> you know, why is it that you always have to feel like you have to apologize when you proclaim the truth? You know, I tell them, well, well, what do you do, Jeff? What do you do for a living? What's your job? I always feel like i got to apologize for telling what I do. And I don't know why that is or why I feel that way. But I say, well, I'm a, I'm a street preacher. I'm an open-air preacher. I'm a, I'm a full-time evangelist. Really? What do you do? Well, <laughs> I go out on the street and I preach the gospel. You do what? That is it. We've heard it all. God says to be faithful. He is the one that brings in the harvest. We obey him, whether it works or not. Point two, preaching as an indictment. You know, sometimes when we go out to the streets and we proclaim the word of God, sometimes it's not always to save. Sometimes it's an indictment. Sometimes you bring judgment and warnings. I'll tell people sometimes on the street, listen, I'm, I'm not out here to preach some pretty little message to you. I'm here to warn you to flee from the wrath to come and to turn over your rebellious hearts to the living God while you still got time, while you still have breath in your lungs. Repent of your sin. Forsake your evil ways. And turn toward the Lord. Trust in His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus says, all who come to me, I will no eyes cast out. But you must come. You see, but the scriptures say <laughs> that when He spoke out like that to the Pharisees, it says they searched and they searched and searched the scriptures. Because in them they thought they had life. But Jesus said, you won't come to me that you may live. And then His disciples asked Him, what must we do to do the works of God? And He said, this is the works of God that you believe upon me. You see, instead of obeying the commands of our king to go into the world and publicly proclaim his word in truth, we rebel against that command. And then we compensate in so many other areas and we make excuses. And then we turn on those that are doing it. And we make them feel like less than because of what they're doing and we know it's right. It's kind of like two people on a diet. You're setting yourself up for a 30-day diet. Halfway through it, one quits and one succeeds. What's the guy that quit? You're going to think of the guy that succeeded every time he sees them. It's going to be a reproach and a reminder of his failure. So you're telling people you're off sharing your faith, you're off proclaiming the gospel, not in pride, not ridiculing others, not looking down on other people. But when you bring it up, say, listen, I go out and, and I proclaim the word of God in the open air, a lot of the times, it's not meant with one of these. Oh, good job. We'll be behind you. Oh, good job. 
you want to give money to your ministry, you want to back you up. Usually it's the exact opposite. Usually it's looked on as disdain. Why is that? I'm sure you guys probably have the answer. Preaching is an indictment. Psalms 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So we're making a declaration. We're making a declaration of a God they already know exists. The God they're rebelling against. You see, they know God exists. James Boyce says that there's enough awareness upon humanity to put them in hell for all eternity. Enough awareness of God upon humanity to put them into hell for all eternity. Spurgeon says that man's conscience cries out, the wrath to come, the wrath to come, because of the guilt of sin. Has a voice that declares there's a wrath to come, that there is justice for the crimes that you committed against God. You are not a victim, you are a criminal. And our conscience declares those who are not right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, their conscience convicts them of sin. And there's a voice that attaches to that that declares that there is a wrath coming and there is a judgment to come. The Bible says that by faith Noah, being warned of God, of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he just didn't pound the boat the whole time for 120 years. He preached. He was a preacher. And that boat became his pulpit. And for 120 years he proclaimed the truth to an apostate world. Noah was right and the whole world was wrong. On a side note, in the book titled The Criminalization the criminalization of Christianity, Janet Folger writes her interview with Jeffrey Satinover. Satinover, who holds degrees from Princeton and doctors from Yale, MIT, and Harvard, was on her radio program one day, and she asked him about where we are in history. He explained that according to the Babylonian Talmud, the book of rabbinical interpretation of the scriptures written a thousand years before Christ, there's been only one time in history that reflects where we are right now. According to these writings, at only one other time in history were men given to men in marriage and women given to women. Do you want to venture as to when? <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Homosexuality was rampant then, but according to the Talmud, not homosexual marriage. What about ancient Greece? No. Babylon? No. Rome? No again. The one time in history when homosexual marriage was practiced, Satinov reports, was during the days of Noah. And according to Satinov, that's what the Babylonian Talmud says was the final straw that led to the flood. And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We live in violent times. Dangerous times. Therefore, we need dangerous preachers. Men who are willing to live dangerously. To go into places that very few people will go into. I spent two years in Scotland, um, by the grace of God, was able to go there and live there for two years, supported by a church that was being planted there. My assignment was to go into the city and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Scotland, as we all love to read the history of Scotland's preachers, um, Scotland is no longer the spiritual hub as it used to be. The, the missionary hub of the world that would go out uh, in great missionary power and reaching the heathen. They're not like it anymore. Less than 1% are born again. And it's been renamed, instead of Scotland, it's called Gangland. It's the knife crime capital of all of Europe. So here it was that 
the Lord had thrown me in to this almost completely dark place to proclaim this truth in the middle of a city where I didn't really even belong. Even though God had sent me there, I belonged there in the sight of God. But I certainly wasn't the most popular guy in the sight of the Scots. And I remember after about a year and a half preaching, I went there as an Arminian, by the way. And I remembered that I would go out there and I would preach and I was using all forms and ways to reach the lost. Any pragmatic scheme I could use. It even meant pulling the rabbit out of the hat, whatever it took. I was willing to be able to get people to draw close so I could preach the gospel to them. And I remember one day, I was walking out on the street, and I had, had built a team from the church that was out there with me. And I looked at one of the pastors of the church, and I said, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of, of, of doing this dog and pony show out here. And at that time, I had become reformed. I didn't tell anybody. And I read in the beginning of Genesis that in the beginning, God. And that shook me to my core. In the beginning, God. And everything we're doing, we're putting everything before God. A.W. Pink says that, you know, it doesn't make sense to start with man and work your way up to God. We start with God and work our way down to man. In the beginning, God. And it made sense to me. I said, we need to start with God. I began to read more books. I read, I read The Bondage of the Will by Luther. I read The Sovereignty of God by A.W. Payne. And I was absolutely convinced of the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinners. Because I met with those monsters of iniquity every day on the street. And I wondered why I couldn't appeal to them and make a decision. It just didn't work. Something greater than myself had to come in to the equation and to convert and to bring sinners to himself, besides me. So I went out there and I said to him, I said, I'm done with, with all of this stuff. I'm going to go out and I'm going to proclaim the word of God in the open air. And whether one person comes or a thousand, I don't care. I'm going to be faithful to the word of God. And I went out there, I stood up on my stool. And I began to proclaim the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I expounded on the character of God, the law of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God, God being the creator of all things. And then I expounded on the grace of God and the mercy of God and the love of God. And God had brought the largest crowd of sinners I had ever preached to in my entire life. The whole street bottlenecked with people. And the car all the way up the street and up the stairs and into the balconies. And one guy came up to me and says, man, you got all the blast on you. And I preached and I preached myself stupid to the point where they didn't go until I got down and went home. And God did that every single day. I don't believe it was for me so much. It might have been a token showing me that you be faithful in the word of God and I'll draw people under my son. Proclaim the truth. Be faithful in an age of compromise. Don't back down. Stand therefore and proclaim the truth. Worship me and be faithful. Proclaim my son to the world. And it moved the heart of God that people began to gather around. And you see all sorts of different things happen. The manifestation of the power of God's word upon simple humanity. It's like sticking a stick in a bald-faced hornet's neck and whittling it around like that. But all sorts of things going on. Instead of one half, like ten happens. All at once. Fire away. Things flying through the air. People screaming. People trying to get you. Their friends holding them back. Some people weeping, bawling, crying out for mercy. This is no consolation to myself. This is a consolation to the glory of God. And we can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the sovereignty. I want to leave you with this last story. I don't have time to finish the entire sermon. But I want to leave you with this story because it has such a profound effect on my life in my latter years as I retrospectively think back 
And I go, wow, this is an amazing story. It's called, it's called the Arrow. When I was a young man, in my early teens, I had a great obsession for bow hunting. And uh, it, was, it was just, I wasn't a Christian, but I had a friend of mine that him and I would go out into the woods and, and go up into a tree stand and we would wait for deer and we would shoot at them, right? But I had to have the best equipment, you see, before I was going to go out and hunt because I wanted to make sure if I hit the deer, I want to make sure that I kill it, right? And I want the best instruments for accuracy and speed, right? And power. I don't want some flimsy little bow that's not going to do anything but just scare everything away in the woods, right? So I went down, I bought a real nice bow, I bought graphite arrows with real feathers. I bought what was called a Copeland Twister. It was actually a three-headed razor blade arrow tip. had three points on it, all three points were razors, and it had a twist to it. So apparently when it made impacts on the victim, it didn't just go through, but it spun and did more damage and brought it down, right? So we got all cameled up as we did. We went out into the woods. I inched up in my tree. I could hear him climbing up this tree, right? And I'm sitting there, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's getting close to evening. And next thing you know, I mean, I didn't see anything. Next thing you know, I heard a crash. It mean, literally sounded like he fell out of the tree. So I, I, I get down, and something just happened over there. So I go running, I go running over there, right? I go running and see what happened. And he's like, I got a deer. I got a deer. And we're both like just like panicking, you know, because neither one of us ever shot a deer. You know, so we're, 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 we're really, really excited. But, you know, we had studied it out. We knew everything there was to know about deer hunting. So we had all of the wisdom, right? We knew, you know, we knew what would happen, you know, if we hit the deer and all these things that went along with it. We watched the videos and all that stuff. So he's all excited, jumping up and down, getting all crazy and excited, right? So I'm trying to be excited with him. I was a little jealous because I didn't get anything. And I look over and I saw his arrow on the, on the, on the ground. Something inside him was kind of happy that he, that he missed, right? So I walk over there, you know, and, and I, I pick his arrow up. I'm like, you know, I said, you missed. You, you, uh, you missed the deer. He looked at the arrow, he'd come over, he picked the arrow up, and he looked at it, and he goes, No, he says, I didn't miss the deer. The arrow went clean through it. And the deer acted as though it never even felt it. Because, by the way, a passing through shot like this only goes through when it goes through the vitals. She so says, what I've learned that that deer, 70 yards up this path, will be dead. Really? Okay. So there we go. Walking up the path. Walking up the path. Sure enough. You see the arrow path clean through it. The deer didn't even know until it got about 70 yards up the path and fell over dead. So when people tell me preaching in the open air doesn't work, people passing by you, you know, it doesn't work. Hours later, after we're done and gone home, we're sitting down having our meal with our families. Those men and women by which God has sovereignly chose are lying in their beds, bleeding to death. And the gospel being proclaimed it passed clean through them. In their minds, they're being haunted with their own sins and haunted by the living God to turn from their sin. And there they lie dead at the altar of a blood-stained cross. Isaiah 49, 2 says, He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he hath hid me. Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharper than any arrow. So sharp, they don't even feel it when it passes through them until they get 70 yards off the road and they fall over dead. Piercing, even the 
dividing the son of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and of the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things where I sent it. I would encourage you to go out and proclaim the word of God. I would encourage you women to tell 